Thank you, Richard, for the opportunity uh, to be here. It's been a long time since I last visited Stanford. Uh, I think my last visit was an academic visit when I was a physicist, probably 10 years ago. Um, and it's a great honor to be in your program. Um, so t what I'm going to do today is to share with you some of the um, uh, insights that we have obtained during our sort of day-to-day -day business in Asia, and especially I wanted to highlight China. Um, and since I'm primarily tracking nanotechnology um, together with my team, and so I wanted to put these two together. I guess, you know, I thought, you know, nano is very sexy, China is very sexy, put it together is, is a good topic. Um, and s also, like Richard mentioned earlier, China has been viewed as a place to do cheap manufacturing all these years. I mean, low cost, a lot of the US companies, multinational companies move their manufacturing to China. And in fact, you know, companies like GE and Dow, they actually set up R&D labs there now um, because their, their market is there. Um, but what we found in the last few years, especially when we track the nanotechnology R&D and commercialization, we find that China is not only doing low man manufacturing, but they're going to move up, they're moving up the value chain and it's going to take over the value chain for a lot of the manufacturing uh, in, in, in the world. So, well, this is a, a projection. Whether or not there will be other competing economy to, to uh, compete with China, that's another question. But I wanted to share with you some of the insights and, um, uh, in this, in, in this um, seminar today. So how many of you are familiar with nanotechnology? Not all. So maybe, OK, just to give you uh, an intro, a few seconds, or 30 seconds of an introduction of n what nanoscale is. I borrowed the video from uh, Ch Professor Chuck Merkin in Northwestern University. I thought this is one of, the, one of my favorite videos <laughs> about nanoscale. So I, I just wanted to share with you now and s see if you I'm like it. You're building things on a nanometer scale. I don't, I don't even know what a nanometer is. So, so this is a meter, this is a centimeter, this is a millimeter. Is this a nanometer? What's a nanometer? I'm going to try to illustrate it for you. If we shrink you by a factor of two, you're about the size of a small child. Oh, we didn't plug the sound in. Now you're about the diameter of a human hair. That's roughly yeah. what we can see with yeah. the naked eye. There's so much shrinking, and not even close to the Tell you what, why don't we run this from the beginning again? Can you run it from the beginning again? Sure. Now that the to get it on the, the sound on oh, the Oh okay, TV you signal. didn't get it on a, oh okay. You keep saying you're building things on a ah, nanometer scale. I don't, I don't even know what a nanometer is. So, so this is a meter, this is a centimeter, this is a millimeter. This nanometer is a nanometer. you by a factor of two. So there you go. Nanometer is not so mysterious. It's in your, <laughs> your body already. Um, so now, then what is nanotechnology? I think that the definition of nanotechnology, you can find it in textbooks. The way I see it is really the ability to manipulate atoms and molecules to make things with the properties that you desire. And, and, and it's really, at the end of the day, it is about reducing carbon footprint is about lower cost, it's about sustainability. So the, way, the reason why I love nanotechnology, I've been doing this for the last more than a decade, for 15 years, um, and, and as I just see all the, the benefits are coming in a lot of products now you're enjoying today. I mean, just 
look at your cell phone. I'm actually starting a module in the Singapore National University on uh, nanotechnology starting with, with the smartphone and beyond. So I will break, take apart your cell phone. Where's my cell phone? Oh, I don't have a cell phone here. Look at your a Galaxy. Okay, I, don't, I know you like iPhone, but, it's a little, but a Galaxy has more uh, advanced technology. If you have a Galaxy, you, you, your, dis, your touch stuff from the touch screen, okay, eventually that touch screen will be flexible. Anyway, and, and more sensitive. You need nanotechnology for that, and transparent. Um, and your display now is OLED. And OLED, as you can see, it has better resolution. And it, costs, it has less energy consumption. And you go in further, and you have the processor, the memory chips. It's all in nanoscale now. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to store so many music, so many files in your, in your um, uh, smartphone. And, and of course, the processor is getting faster and faster. And then you go further down, you go the batteries. Or you like to charge your battery. You, this, ideally, you want to charge your battery in 10 minutes rather than an hour. Right? If you add nanomaterials to your electro materials uh, for lithium ion battery, you can do that. And of course, you also desire your battery will last more than a day, maybe a week, so without charging. And, and watch movies without you know, charging it very uh, uh, soon. So you need high energy density of your battery, so you need nanomaterials, um, and, and, and so on. And anything that you could, and of course the gyro, all the sensors that you have, you know, now all the, the displays go with you as you flip, and those MEMS are sensors that are nanotechnology, make by nanotechnology. So just look at the smartphone, there's a lot already you use every day, you enjoy the benefit every day, and you wanted to have more benefits from that, and in the future it will be wearable, obviously. Now the trend is the wearable electronics, it's emerging, and it's not far, very, very soon. If you look at that uh, photo on the um, right-hand side, that's already a f uh, not, not flexible yet, but bendable displays. Uh, that's actually one of the Samsung's the next generation phone. Um, and then, of course, the o OLED lighting is going to be in your classroom very soon. I mean, in fact, I wouldn't, if I'm an investor, I wouldn't even invest in uh, LED anymore because OLED is coming. And all this lighting that you see will be replaced by just plain lighting, 2D, rather than, you know, LED is spotlight. So you need, you need a lot of lights to, to, to light up this room. But um, OLED is much more efficient. Um, and and uh, of course, sporting goods. Sporting goods that you, in, in California, I think you do a lot of sports. You want to do bicycle, um, you do mountain bikes, and you need very strong bikes. In, you need nano composite nowadays made of um, bikes are made of nano composites, etc. So there are a lot of uh, um, areas or you know, industries that nanotechnology can play a role, including, well, of course, what I just mentioned um, electronic industry, consumer electronic industry, displays, including displays, energy, including solar cells, uh, batteries, e electrical, electrical vehicles, and trans transportation, aeroplanes, and and boats. I will show you a video about you know the, uh, a, a boat that actually made of uh, carbon nano composite, and, and water filtration, construction, and, and medicine. And I, I mean, I'm not going to elaborate more in this area. But if you're interested, we can you can talk to me later how these uh, how nanotechnology can impact all these uh, sectors. But there are products today uh, in these sectors. Um, so just. I mean, uh, just for another video, just for fun, um, I'll show you another boat, how powerful it is if it is made of uh, nano composite. Now, uh, uh, a lot of boats now, I don't know whether you're familiar with boats or you like boats, but so this is just a demonstration of uh, uh, the largest object made out of uh, uh, nanomaterials. Basically, what it is is that this boat is primarily carbon composite with a few percent of carbon nanotube as additives in it, so that with few percent of carbon nanotube give you the mechanical strength enhancement of 30 percent. So that, what does that translate to economically? Now if you have a lighter boat, a stronger boat, you use less material, lighter. Lighter means you use less fuel. So if you run this boat with one tank of fuel, you can go 1,500 miles. So that's much further than a, a boat which is double the weight. And of course, speed-wise, you can go faster. And since your boat can travel much longer, you can go. You can do missions that is impossible. Mission impossible. Uh, with, you know, when you use a normal boat. So just for for fun. Um, oh, maybe 
I cannot play here. I don't know why I can't play here. I'll play you a video later. So I just want to zoom in, just to give you an example to zoom in. I don't know whether you see properly. Now, bef behind the, co the coating of the boat, you see this is a typical carbon fiber composite. Now, it looks it's the same as normal carbon fiber composite, but if you actually look under the, S, uh, um, you cut the material and you look at the cross section and the epoxy, carbon, co co carbon fiber composite is actually carbon fiber and epoxy together. And typically the cracks happens in, between, in the interface between carbon fiber and epoxy. So when you add nanotube in the epoxy, basically you disperse nanotube evenly in the epoxy, the nanotube is, is like glue very sticky. So it sticks much better on the carbon fiber than without. So then you get a much stronger composite. That's how it works, basically. So that basically, you know, for, you, you have to look at, look at the material under the microscope. Otherwise, you won't be able to see it. Microscopically, that's what it looks like. Um, so he, he's the sort of figures that, you know, a very speed 42 knots is a very high speed for a boat and 150 uh, 1,500 miles, uh, nautical miles is a very long range also. So uh, now I don't know whether, the, oh yeah, the, the video is here. Let's see if it plays. Oh, this is a very short one, so it's okay. It's a military, more <laughs> military <laughs> thing. I think I'll stop this too long. Um, I'll go to China. <laughs> um, now, this boat is made in USA. Okay. Zyvex. Zyvex is yeah. the company, right? That's yes. a US company. So uh, the boat yard is in uh, Seattle. So now, I haven't seen, we, 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 we have gone all over all Asia. We haven't seen anything like that in Asia. So what does that tell you? US is still leading advanced manufacturing. I mean, if you look at in, in this way. Now, um, a lot of you, if you're in academic, you probably have noticed that China has published, uh, you know, China has, is known to publish a lot of good papers. You know, a large number of publications has grown in the last 10 years very dramatically. And also even patent, you see, in nanotechnology, you know, patent number of applications also has increased dramatically. But the quality is a different question. Number does not translate into quality and also doesn't tell you how commercialization the commercialization situation. Um, it doesn't really reflect innovation when you have publication and patent. Um, and, and if you, in fact, you know, I, I, I don't know how many of you have visited universities uh, in China. I think Richard does a lot of those visits. Um, you know, nowadays, I mean, compared with 10 years ago, a lot of Chinese universities and uh, Chinese Canadian Renaissances are equipped with state-of-the-art instruments. You go to a lab in Beijing University, it's the same as here, you know, nanofabrication facility, characterization facility, anything you want. Um, and, you know, people busy working, no, no difference really. Um, but if you look at the really tech transfer, not so good in the university. But if you go to the Chinese Academy of Sciences, you go to the big sign of Chinese university, the Chinese Academy of Sciences, a big sign or say Institute of Chemistry, for example, you walk in, you see another sign, company or another company. So Chinese Academy of Sciences have been a, a great incubator for their spin-offs. Um, but universities, in, in now technology at least, not talking about IT or other fields, but I haven't seen many. Now, if, if you have ever worked with industries in China, Chinese industry, I, you know, I walked into a lot of companies like Huawei and uh, ZTE, all these companies, very poor R&D. Um, we, you know, we try to, we have helped in our business on a daily basis, we help a lot of U.S. companies try to transfer their technology to 
uh, China manufacturers to, for licensing and so on. It, it's one of the most challenging thing for us is that if you don't have a ready solution, ready product, it's very difficult for, to work with the Chinese uh, industries. Because unlike Japanese industries or, or Korean industries, where R&D is very strong, if you look at Samsung, NEC, Sony, all these companies have very strong R&D. They do uh, everything by themselves. They cover the whole value chain. But China, like I said in the beginning, traditionally has been focusing on low-end manufacturing, so very poor R&D, although it's starting. But there's a big gap between the academic publication and industry adoption. Um, so, but but because of the competition, global competition, the industries are looking for differentiation. They wanted to launch competitive products. They wanted to move up the value chain. So they need solutions uh, enabled by R&D. So where do, how do they fill, it, fill up the gaps? So there are two trends that we have observed. One, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the Chinese economic sciences are spinning off companies. And then another very strong emerging trend is the overseas Chinese returnees who are educated could be in Stanford, Harvard, you know, anywhere, Northwestern, Cambridge, you know, in Japan, somewhere, University of Tokyo. They go back, attracted by a lot of, supported by a lot of government incentives, and set up companies. And we've seen that more and more now, um, especially with the funding so uh, uh, decreasing, difficult in getting funding in, in Europe and in US and, and elsewhere. You know, that's so uh, another dr driving factor for those technopreneurs to go back to China. Um, well, f of course, it's, there are a lot of incentives for them to go back. One is they're, they're closer to their family, the parents, and, and they have fundings from the government and also manpower. They have a lot of manpower there. Um, so, and these are driven by the needs for solving problems and, and also towards building better and cheaper products. That's, that's really the goal there. And we project in the next five to ten years, China will compete in every part of the value chain in, in different industries and especially in advanced manufacturing. And I will show you the examples later. Um, enabled by R&D and, and nanotech is an enabler. So uh, let me just give you an example of how that is happening. And this is real companies that we have visited and, 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 and interacted with in China. And so there's a company working very actively in LED. And this is actually a professor. He's a very entrepreneurial. He's, he's never been overseas. He's based in Shanghai. And he's set up, he's developed a material uh, for LED, the phosphor material, which is very important for white light. And so in the past, the phosphor supply are dominated by Japanese companies. But today, because Chinese domestic suppliers are much cheaper, it's often it's good enough kind of performance. It don't, it, it, you don't have to be the best. It's good enough, and they're taking over that um, value chain. So traditionally, if you see, okay, um, Traditionally, Chinese are, uh, companies are focusing on assembly, right? And now they're moving up the value chain to the, uh, in the material and wafer. And, and similarly, in b battery, a lot of you have used lithium-ion battery. There's uh, a very important additives is nanocarbon materials uh, provided by Showa Denko. And, and especially those batteries made in Japan. I don't know about the Chinese uh, uh, batteries, but the Japanese battery has very high performance ones and, and have this very secret additives, a few percent, that gives you a very long lifetime. That's what I'm using today in my <laughs> laptop. And so traditionally, again, dominated by Japanese suppliers, but now it's taken over by Chinese companies. Instead of using this um, nanocarbon material, which is a combination of uh, nanotube and carbon fiber, nanocarbon fiber, now nanotube only. And I wouldn't mention the name of the company, but they, they are here. Um, the technology firm come from China and manufacture in China, but they have an office here also. So that's how, you, that's how, you know, that's how we see, we, we analyze the value chain. We look at what, what's going on in this industry, and we look at the upstream, the R&D advancement material. And Chinese companies are taking over this part as well. And it's very, moving very rapidly. Speed is important. I think speed is how they become successful in the market. Now, I'll give you a case study how this is happening. Um, I want to highlight also the public partner, pu public
private partnership that actually accelerates this, what I'm talking about, the taking over of the value chain and, and advance, advancing manufacturing. So I want to take an example of the Suzhou Industry Park. I don't know uh, how many of you are familiar with Suzhou Industry Park. This is a very interesting industry park started by a joint venture between Singapore and Suzhou City. That was 17 years ago. At that time, Suzhou wanted to attract Fortune 500, basically copy, exact copy of Singapore model. Singapore model is to attract all the Fortune 500 companies to do manufacturing, not R&D, manufacturing. After 10 years, and I'll, I'll continue the story later, but, but I wanted to touch upon the nanotechnology initiative in that, in that area. Now, so they started in the 90s, and now 2005, the industry park executive realized, recognized that nanotechnology is an enabler to advance their industry, to upgrade their industry. Very visionary, they're thinking ahead. How can we go forward with our manufacturing? We can't just do low end, we have to go forward. Um, we have to do R&D. So they recognize nano is an enabler. What they do is how to build this, they started to build this nanotech capability. What they do is instead of like many other industry parks, you build buildings. Right. Typical, if you're familiar with China, there's a lot of real estate investment. They build buildings and then hopefully, you know, to hope to attract companies to set up there without any intelligent design. But these guys, they have an intelligent design. So instead of just building buildings, they first set up an institute. They wanted to copy the Fang Hofer model, Fang Hofer Institute, or ITRI model in Taiwan to build a institute basically application R&D driven institute, which is different from most of the Chinese Academy of Sciences research institute, which mostly uh, working on basic research. But this is probably the first, I think it's the first application driven R&D institute built and, and, and nanotechnology focus. With that institute built, with the capability built, research facility built, and then they build an incubator called BioBay to accommodate companies from overseas, the, tech, the, the returnees to come and set up companies and also spin off from that institute. So incubator with that, and then three years ago, they even went further. They, they launched the so-called Nanopolis Initiative to build an entire ecosystem for nanotechnology. Ecosystem meaning you take care of not only the R&D, you do build a value chain, you build a service, you build the whole ecosystem that, so that the industry can survive, um, which is very intelligent. I can tell you more uh, if, if, if we have time, but let me just keep moving. Um, and and this, this initiative is a billion dollar investment, which is probably the most aggressive, I think in our uh, opinion, it is the most aggressive initiative in nanotechnology commercialization. And it's very organized. Um, now, like I said earlier, initially they attract the industry attracts mostly Fortune 500 companies. A lot of US companies are there setting up, including 3M, uh, set up their manufacturing. Um, but, and, and, but then with that, this, this is my friend uh, who's a general manager of BioBay. She comes here a lot to attract companies to go there. And I just like to quote her. She said, you know, from living by a big fish to raising your own fish, a small fish. I mean, they, they build this big, they attract all this big company. And Bao Bay is really a platform to incubate all these you know, uh, small fish. And she's extremely successful. Over six years period, period sorry. So is Bao Bay a Chinese organization yeah. or is it here? Chinese. Chinese, OK. Right Based there. in Suzhou. Yeah, yeah, it's, a, okay. it's an incubator. OK, she's, incubator. She, she managed to attract 250 companies in six years. OK, OK. Biotech related. And, and then partially nanotech, but now nanotech has uh, their own initiative now, three years later. She, she started this whole bio bay, and then, and then nanotech now has spun off into an ecosystem. In fact, the, it's the, the nanopause was launched January this year. It's ready. Phase one is ready. <laughs> it's a government-backed organization. And, but they attract a lot, 80% of the incubates are overseas Chinese returnees, set up, uh, run by Chi overseas Chinese returnees, which is an interesting observation. Um, so to do all that, so, the, the, so I want to come back to the private, uh, public-private partnership. So, so to, in order to set all this up, right, if government, 
the Chinese way, right? Top down, um, put in a lot of government funding and build the infrastructure. The infrastructure, what I mean by that is not just building, but facilities, R&D facilities, pilot production facilities to allow companies, research institution to share that facility with a lower, co very low cost to really help the startups um, to lower their costs. One of the things that I find, you know, the observation between, you know, startups in Silicon Valley and startups in China is that the burn rate in China is so low. It's probably 10% of the burn rate here. I mean, I have interacted with a lot of companies here. I mean, typically a 20 people company here, a burn rate is a million dollars, between half, half a million to a million dollars. For in a year. A year. Yeah. Sorry, no, but monthly. With 10 employees? With facilities and everything. Oh, okay. With, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, half a million to a million per month. Yeah, okay. That's okay. a big, very big burn rate. But in China, very minimal, 10%. That's why it's very easy for them to be profitable. So ha that, this is a, I mean, I want to highlight this because the government absorb a lot of the costs. Like they get free rent, they get uh, funding so for R&D, they, they pay half of the salary, which is already low, much lower than here. And, and they get the infrastructure's almost very minimal fee, access to the facilities for, for very minimal. So that's how you get, I mean, that's why the solar, I mean, how do you compare, compete in the solar industry? Same thing, a lot of subsidies from the government. That's why, you know, it kills everybody, you know. Yeah. To the government? That's right. Well, the government, they don't expect, the, the return for the government is to generate employment. It's, it's very similar, I mean, Singapore does the same thing, right? When multinational, when 3M comes in to Singapore or China, they give them like 50% subsidy for all the entire operation costs. And what they get back is employment. They employ, 3M employ you know, a lot of people in both places. And then, and then of course, the tax uh, at the end. Is that a billion dollars coming from the government then? Yes, yes. So who, who will own uh, intellectual property. The company. Company, yes. Yeah, and, and, and if you file a patent, they give you also bonus as well, the government. <laughs> That's why they file a lot of crap patents. <laughs> it's, it's, it's any patent. So you, I don't take the patent, those you patents seriously. You said the pilot plant also has been subsidized by the yes, government, right? that's right. But how come the pilot plant would be generic? Because each of the companies would have different needs in right. terms of pilot plant. Right. So I'll give you an example. I'm actually going to go to that later. But, um, so they built this um, in the Nanopolis. They built this six-inch MAMS pilot plant. This is tens of millions of dollars investment. Well, of course, they buy equipment secondhand to lower the cost. Um, so this pilot plant is available for industry and the research institution to come and use it. And they still have to figure out how to manage this. This is brand new. Okay? This is just set up. It's going to be ready, up and running sometime end of this year. Um, in terms of how this is going to operate to be you know, self-sustained, I think they're still working on it. They're, hire, they're, they're hiring managers to try to do that. So anyone want a job? <laughs> Go there. <laughs> um, so, so the foundation, the public-private partnership, the government put in a lot of support um, and, and coupled with the entrepreneurship of the Chinese technopreneurs, uh, scientists, and with the high speed of the speed is really critical. In China, we are impressed with the speed, absolutely. And then, you know, investment and, and with the talent. You need people to do the work a lot of, I mean, looks like uh, they've, they've been very successful in attracting talents, um, the Chinese government, and they're very aggressively recruiting everybody. And then they target at the market, Chinese market. I mean, I have colleagues in Singapore, went to China and set up companies. And this is a, a ideal for them because they can't do anything in Singapore because no market there. And uh, incentive for spin-off is not that good. Uh, it's difficult to raise money, so they go to, go to China. This basically, the consequence of that for foreign companies is that if they take over the domestic market, it's difficult for the f multinationals to operate. So that's uh, th um, a alarm for um, foreign companies. And then, of course, eventually, now I'm personally, I'm also seeing Chinese companies is trying to go global. I mean, different from Japanese companies, I spent a lot of time in Japan, and I, I think there's a very big difference between the Chinese companies and Japanese companies. A lot of Japanese companies, especially small ones, are very domestic focused because Japan already have a big market, right? more than 100 million people. But the Chinese, they have a billion dollar, billion people market, billion people market, yeah. And 
they want to go global from day one. I mean, it's, it's, it's a different mindset. Uh, so, but yeah, I, like I said earlier, you know, the public-private partnership playing a, a very important role in accelerating the commercialization of nanotechnology in China, and with the, the government support building up ecosystem and infrastructure. And it, it's very organized. I mean, at a top-down way of manner, if you compare with other countries in Asia, it's, it's, it's very organized. Um, and to so further look at how this it's done, I mentioned earlier this is 1.5 billion investment of nanopolis, I mentioned earlier. Um, and, and they prepared the ecosystem value chain. Now, when I talk about, when I mentioned organized, let me tell you how organized. So in, in this, nanotech apparently can do many things, right? So you have to look at the industry sector. Let's look at LED, if you look at uh, solar, you look at um, light, well, light, lighting, lighting, lighting is one, and solar, and then um, MEMS, right? MEMS for sensors and, and others. So they look, they, they will identify what makes sense, what industry makes sense. And then they look at what capability they have. Remember I mentioned the, the institute that they set up, in the early, the Van Hofer type of institute they set up? So they is the regional government? Yeah, the, the, this, the this industry people part. who are in charge of this yeah, science industry part. part. Yeah, okay. so the, is the executive, yeah. the management uh, yeah. uh, um, organization. So when they have this institute, they already build up the capability, technical capability. For example, battery. They have a bi battery pilot plant. They have solar. They have the, the scalium nitride, this power electronic scalium nitride platform. So they already have all this platform. And they look at, with this platform, what I can build in terms of industry value chain and what's missing in, in the industry part. And then, and then very organically, they engage companies or talents or capabilities to fill in the gap to complete that value chain. And then the, and, and complete the ecosystem. So that's how organized they are. I mean, I, I'm, I'm really like impressed. I mean, I haven't seen anyone you know, organize the industry part in this way, in emerging technology. Um, and of course, you do, you, you cover, you know, the path to market is you do, you start from the you know, technology idea, you support the research, development, prototyping, mass production. So you can do all that. They want, they want the companies to be able to do all this within the park. Now, from in terms of co-financing, I've talked about financing before. Uh, the entrepreneurs can get money. Now, uh, in case you're interested, basically, it's a sort of, if they say, OK, Richard, you want to go and set up a company, they will say, OK, we give you in kind, so sort of in total, 10 million RMBs, like 1.6 million US dollars. You're pretty much committed. You come, but you have to first set up a company and commit a million RMB first to set up a company, so a capital put in the capital, and then you get the grants like free lab, office rental, and, and housing. You can literally live there for free when you go there. You don't have to worry about those costs. So, so for a lot of the technopreneurs going back, they actually go back mainly male uh, in their 40s and 50s, and they leave the family behind in Silicon Valley or in you know, New York somewhere. You know, they go back, adventure. You know? a lot of, they have a lot of fun. Uh, back in Suzhou over there. Or, or this is just one example, but uh, is that a special thing for returnees, or is that yeah, really special thing for, for anything? Anybody, for returnees any and for uh, if you can manage the Chinese language, you can go there too. Okay. Okay. Yeah. If, but you have to have a technology. Okay. You have to have the well, sure. idea, a proposal. Yeah. Yeah. But really, somebody who is not a returnee, right? Not originally from China or family from China. It's also accessible. Yes. The language yeah. issue is the issue. Oh, and language is an issue. Yeah. Because you have to write the proposal in Chinese. Okay. Which is a problem. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sure. But if you sure. can hire somebody to do that, no yeah, problem. Okay. Okay. <laughs> we don't provide that service. <laughs> um, so I mentioned earlier. Um, so anyway, it's pretty attractive. It's it's basically make you very easy. Like you can go there, live for free leave your family behind and you can just do, just focus on your innovation and work on the product, right? That's all you need to worry about. And they want to make things happen? No, what no. happens if they fail? What oh, happens if they, if they don't generate then they go the home. IP or I'm going to go back to the US. Or <laughs> do, are they required to, to give back the money? No. 
Okay. Unless it's okay. I didn't mention there's a there's a financing there's a, a grant that given by the government which doesn't require any uh, no equity no nothing, but there's uh, another part that it's like five million I think five point three million, it's supported by the VC it's equity. So well you can claim bankruptcy is so that's what they do. Now this is for the fields that the government has decided on right. Um, is it they have any a strategic kind of business? No, they have a strategic areas. For example, okay, water. Yeah. Right? Water is a good technology. Right. If you have said anything on water, that makes sense. On an environment, you know, clean up the air, water. Um, of course, anything on MEMS, anything on lighting, okay. solar, things that they think is important for them. Yeah, okay. Not, okay, not quantum computing. But yeah, sure. <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> You know, one of the things is they're aiming at having full supply chains inside the park. Yeah. They want everything from the first components and materials all right. the way into final right, assembly right. kind mm -hmm. of in the park, right? Right. It sounds like they're creating Japanese business groups. Yeah. <laughs> I think they're, hmm, they're very, also, they try to work with international bodies as well. Yeah. So they try to create international alliances. With Japan, with Korea, with oh US. sure, but yeah, but Europe. the thing of having a supply chain that is, rel you know, independent companies, but yet all in the same area yeah. and all kind of depending on the same value chain, right? Is but that's okay. That's it's not there yet. Yeah, it's being built. Okay. Okay. So it's in the process. Okay. Maybe five years down the road, you you see pretty good. But in LED, it's pretty comprehensive. Now the reason LED. I mention that is because the different kind of profit margins. The component business is an ugly business after a while because there will always be someplace cheaper you can do manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? And yeah. advanced manufacturing is great for a while while that window is open, but then somebody else learns how to do the same yeah. advanced manufacturing. Yes, yeah, yeah. So how do you build this up into a sustainable thing where they're continuing to innovate? That's yet to be observed. Yeah, this is this is <laughs> yeah. the next problem. Yeah. Yeah, but what what they're trying to do, like I I was watching the LED industry value chain. They're, they're pretty comprehensive now. They have the wafer guys, they have the packaging, they have the material people, and you know the market as well. So mm -hmm. I mean, keep in mind that you know every Chinese region is like a country in Europe. It's big. You know, if you look at the region, this Suzhou region, they have the regions already twenty million people. The whole Jiangsu province is 100 million people. I mean, that's inside. This is a city, one of the major cities in the province. Um, yeah, so the market is attractive. Um, so I mentioned earlier the Chinese Academy of Sciences have a very flexible spin-off um, mechanism. So they allow you to park your company on site. And it's amazing, they like, because the institute owns your company. So you, you can do everything. So I see, in fact, a lot of, ins uh, there's a strong incentive to spin off companies constantly. In fact, every month, you know, I see it like every month there are new companies being set up, uh, nanotech companies. What happens is that it's also a way to get more funding. Because if you spin off a company, you can get additional funding other than your R&D funding, like at an institute, you can get the funding for the company. So that's why you can get, you know, the funding for the company and the institute, and they both pay for the same people. So. You know, they have no conflict. There's no conflict of interest because the institute owns those companies, <laughs> and they just get company from another government organization, either central government or um, regional government and VCs. So you you get basically is a way to capture as much capital as possible you know, to, for for the R and D, and they can use the labs. They can you know have the same people doing the, doing both research and uh, for the company product development. So. A lot of very flexible mechanisms that doesn't work here. Well, it works there. And of course, the government-backed VCs I mentioned earlier that will take equity of. Do you mind if I ask a question at, at this point? So I've also seen the same kind of things with universities in China, yes. right? Universities can own startup companies that spin out of the university research. Mm -hmm. uh, do they think about an exit when they create the company? I mean, is there a point of time when the university or the Chinese Academy of Sciences would sell all their stock in the company and get out of it and do something different? 
Uh, let me give you one example. This um, yeah. company, I'm going to actually one of my case studies. Okay. And it's already IPO. Okay. Uh, Suzhou University. The university actually it, it's a, one of the major sh uh, shareholder. I think the university ex exited. Okay. When they go okay. IPO. So. Mm -hmm. It's I mean, it's such a big country. Everything is possible over there. <laughs> Another quote, like uh, from this uh, company that moved from uh, Shanghai to Suzhou, I, I think. But but we we'll talk about ecosystem. I mentioned ecosystem. Just a little bit more uh, detail on on the ecosystem. So, of course, now I mentioned earlier the R and D platforms. Set up this institute, provide the R and D platforms capabilities. That's very. That's that's really. Very important to differentiate this industry park from the many other industry parks. This is really critical for the ecosystem. And then, and then of course, you, you engage industry partners already in the industry park or outside the industry park. And, and then you attract the talent. And, and then you do the startup. And then also the investors and, 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 fun, and fundings. So this is how they see it as an ecosystem um, over there. And, and, and talk about talents. So this is really important for, the, for, for this whole ecosystem. Talent, peop without people, you can't make anything. You can't make anything happen, um, not, not buildings. So these are the people who come, a lot of them coming from overseas. They are really world top technical exp experts uh, with venture experience, with global business experience. Could be somebody from Dow here, go back. You know, could be from you know, 3M to go back there and do something. And I've, I've, I, I visited a company actually used to work for um, one of the multinationals. Not Dow, one of the chemical companies in the US. DuPont. DuPont, yeah. So they left. They left the company and, and <laughs> started their own company. I don't know what they do with the IP. Uh, right. So that's why they keep a very low profile. <laughs> no websites. The company has no website. <laughs> very typical, OK? so. <laughs> And uh, uh, like as I mentioned earlier, 80% of the over 200 companies of BioBase are uh, uh, established by foreign talents. <laughs> anyway, so, so this is a quote from my my um, my senior consultant. Actually, he prepared a presentation for me. Uh, he is Australian. I mean, he lived in Japan for 20 years, fluent in Japanese. So he you know, helped me in China. Every time he goes there, he's just said, it's crazy. This place is just <laughs> amazing. I mean, he lived in Japan, worked in Fujitsu for 15 years. He knows very well the Japanese corporate culture and everything. You see similarities in the, engineer, in the engineers, the passion for innovation and, 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 and developing new products. But the difference is that the Chinese engineers are entrepreneur. They go to the market faster. They are interested in going to the market rather than just focusing, staying in innovating uh, product. So, so that's his quote. <laughs> um, so today, in fact, there are, in our statistics, there are 50 nanotech companies in that park uh, within the last few years, but 200 related companies. That's official figure is 200, but my objective assessment is only 50. But others are kind of nano related, not really nano. Hmm. I'll give you some case studies later. Um, so just to, for you to sort of take home with the key messages about the entrepreneurs in, in that region. Um, so the key to success are the engineers, scientists, and entrepreneurs on the ground. Um, and they're just you know, going for it. Very pragmatic, down-to-earth attitude. Can do, you know, want to advance, no fear, very optimistic. They're optimistic. This is amazing. The optimism of those guys is just amazing. They think that anything is possible. They'll make it happen. Um, and OK, this is, so compared with Singapore, since I'm based in Singapore, and I, you know, I would like to compare okay, Singapore, Japan, and, and Taiwan, and all different places. And, and let's just look at Singapore. Now, Singapore, if some of you are familiar with Singapore, Singapore pay a lot of people to go, to go there. Yeah? They, um, you know, multinational big companies, uh, universities. Um, you know, MIT has a center there, you know, Cambridge. Um, Singapore go for the brand, basically. Brand is important. They wouldn't go for some universities not prominent. They go for prominent universities, and, and they pay them to go there. It doesn't matter what the outcome is, really. I mean, they just want to look good. While the Chinese, they want substance. They want you to actually deliver. I mean, that's a very different, um, very different attitude. Uh, <coughs> Yeah, and, and, and yeah, this is what I 
<laughs> um, so that's, I think that's pretty much it. And I'll go to the, the case studies now. Um, yeah, oh, one, one thing about the value chain. Now, what I see in a lot of industries today, um, face, say solar. In the solar industry, equipment, the, the equipment is still pretty much foreign, it's imported equipment. And, and also LED, like the MOCVD systems are made in Japan or Germany or even US. Um, so the equipment part, China has not been very good in terms of machinery. Um, it takes longer time to build that capability. And Japan is still very dominant. Japan, German, Germany, the two countries are very dominant in the, in the machine equipment business. So they've been doing very, very well. Um, that's why you know, Germany, <laughs> Germany's economy is doing extremely well. We, they're all the you know, export in their um, the equipment. But things are changing in China. I mean, some, at least we have the companies that we visited, like in the area of um, like LED especially, now they're, they're starting to develop their own equipment and de de their own uh, proprietary processes. So that's emerging, but it's not a um, very strong capability yet, but you, you see that you know, different uh, small, still you know, SMEs doing that yet, um, not, not a, a big trend yet, but it's emerging. So something to keep in mind. So if you're in the equipment business, hurry up you know, before they, <laughs> they will not be buy, buying your equipment very soon. Um, so and VCs, um, a lot of VCs in China is just overwhelming number of uh, VCs. Basically, financing is not a problem in that in, in over there. If you have a good idea, no problem getting funding. Funding is not a problem. And market is, is not a problem. It's about getting the business done, getting to the market. But of course, when, I, when we look at all these companies, um, now the ones that I picked are very, very good. But the ones that are spinning off now, I think half of them are rubbish. So it's not going to die very soon. <laughs> because uh, again, it's the, this, this, this trend of, because of getting more money, trying to get more money, just to spin off company just for the sake of getting more money. That's not good. That's not sustainable. Uh, intellectual property, I think a lot of people are wrong about that now. Um, there's no absolute protection anywhere. Um, and this is, we have to face the fact. I mean, that's a fact, uh, that's a life, okay? We can't protect intellectual property. Um, now, Suzhou, on the other hand, is kind of rather safe uh, compared with the rest of China because they have very strong IP protection and prosecution um, um, practice. And, but in practice, is hire people you trust, be very selective, and treat them well and retain them. And, uh, and if you still don't feel confident, keep your core IP outside of China. So that's how you do it. Um, but at the end, I mean, the, the Chinese company may not license IP from you. Most of the time, they prefer not to unless it's absolutely necessary. But they take ideas from you, and they do it on them by themselves. I mean, I think Japan, same thing, I mean, in, 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 in this way. Um, and, and, and often, the solution is good enough. You know, in China, is a good enough solution is, is, is OK to get into the Chinese market. Um, let me give you a few case studies on you know, um, a few, three companies that I, or four companies that I, I picked are doing pretty good. Um, so our first one is a very early stage company, very, very young company. The guy, Professor Xu, and he's a full-time employee of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Okay. And he, he's educated in Japan. Uh, I think he worked in Sony briefly. And so his core technology is gallium nitride. He grow gallium nitride in a very low cost way. So he basically used the, the institute as his, uh, his company is an inside institute. He has you know, six um, machines, grow the uh, two inch, now two and four inch um, gallium nitride. Of course, what is, uh, I don't know whether you're familiar with gallium nitride. Gallium nitride is a very, it's an emerging 3.5 material that for power electronics. For the future and LED lighting, right? <coughs> so it's a very, it's an emerging, very uh, hot materials now for, um, um, and and of course, to low to be able to ha produce this material low cost, it's critical for the market adoption of this material. Um, it's for lasers. In fact, uh, they make the, together with their partner. You see that big projectors over there, so big. This projector, LCD projector. They make in China now a, a small, a little bit bigger than this projector, portable, 
I actually have one copy. I, I asked them to give me a, a sample, so I, I didn't carry it with me, but I have one over to me. But, um, so th that portable projector that's um, uh, using the, the light, one of the li lasers, the light source is gallium nitride. <coughs> so they make this kind of products um, now in China. Um, so again, the, the guy, I mean, it's very early stage. They are not, they are kind of almost break even. So these people who are making gallium nitride wafers, yes. right? have started making the projector itself? They work with the, the company. Oh, they work yeah, with yeah, the projector. Yeah, okay, yeah. okay. So they provide the wafer. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. <laughs> but they are looking at not just wafer. They want to also move up the value chain. They want to make um, power electronic devices as well. Um, so and, and this is primarily now focusing the Chinese market. But again, the whole company is being incubated in the Chinese chemical sciences. And they have revenue enough for, for them to almost break even which is totally impossible if you have any company outside of China because, like I said earlier, all the in-kind support that they get. Um, another company called Ni Nano Micro, the guy, Professor Dr. Jiang, and he's actually educated in the U.S. I mean, he's a, he has an interesting story. He worked in U.S. companies. He left and went back to China because he felt that U.S. companies are very short-term driven. He couldn't do things that would take longer than five years in, ch in, the, in the U.S. So he went back, and he could do whatever he wanted. And he developed uh, this silica sphere. He can control the size, you know, range of different range of sizes, and he sells them now to Chinese, to, to U.S. companies now. I mean, he's now he just you know entered the U.S. market last year. He went for a show here, and and, and in the, uh, previously he had the prim the his primary customers are Japanese companies, LCD uh, makers, and also pharmaceutical companies in China. Um, so it's interesting, and he's profitable. This guy, five years, free rent, and you know, hundred people, already profitable. Oh. Hmm. But interesting, uh, U.S. He thinks that U.S. is much more short-term driven. That's why he couldn't stay here. He go back to China. He can do long-term development. So he's got about a hundred employees in the company. Yeah. Do you know how many of them are technical and how many are sales? Um, majority technical. Okay. About Eighty okay. percent. Okay. Uh, you know, engineers. Mm -hmm. Sales, not, not, not so much. They're yeah. not, see, one thing about the Chinese startups is that they're not so good at sales. Their marketing, their marketing is not that good. Um, not normally, like this, this guy, I mean, he's, he's not, I mean, he's Well, if you've got the market in the, in the same science park. Yeah. <laughs> yes. They don't, in fact, they don't need, because the Chinese market is at the back door, they don't have to do aggressive marketing. Mm -hmm. But they do realize that they are lacking global marketing, so they are trying to figure out what to do. They probably, maybe, you know, American trained marketing people can get a job there. Yeah, you know, <laughs> prime opportunity for you guys. This is one of my favorite companies, Tan Yuan. Um, you know the, the phone that you have? In fact, again, Samsung phone. Samsung is, is one, of, one of the most innovative company in terms of smartphone. In your Samsung's Galaxy, the, um, Heat sink material traditionally has been you, people use copper as heat sink material. No more copper now. This carbon uh, graphite, it's a graphite material. So this is, I mean, I, I, I mean, I'm, I have a few slides about you know, nano carbon material, graphene nanotube graphite. It's great material because it has great conductivity electrically and thermally. It's great mechanical strength. It's just, you, if you make stuff out of this material, it's multifunctional. You get high, you know, very high mechanical strength, very flexible and, and strong. At the same time, electrically conductive and thermally conductive. I mean, the conductivity of this material, it's three times of that of uh, copper. That's why Samsung work with them, and, and they supply this thing uh, to Samsung. And the amazing thing is, this, this company is only two years old, profitable. $20 million sales, 100 people. This is an amazing story. And this guy, he's uh, Professor Dr. Xu, he's Mr. Xu, actually. He's a master degree, an engineer. And he's never went, he never got education in overseas. He's just homegrown technopreneur. Amazing, doesn't speak English. <laughs> I send an email to him in Chinese, he never replies. I mean, in English, he never replies. I have to get my assistant to write Chinese, and, and that's how <laughs> I can communicate with him. <laughs> Um, amazing company. This is one of my you know, favorite uh, entrepreneurs in China. And then this one, 
This one is an int very interesting. Ten years old, ten years company. T last year went IPO in the Shenzhen stock market. Now f a few hundred. Now I think they have grown to five hundred people. Initially, the first five years, they literally lived inside a university. Like, firstly, like no revenue. But when they started to have revenue, then they moved out. And um, now this company, one one of the. Well, one, well, I'm most impressed by this company is that they cover the whole value chain. They make their own equipment, they do their own patterning. So th what it is is that, you know, you know the. Um, let me think of an example. Think of a lotus leaf, self cleaning, huh? structure, structural function. Think of lotus leaves is self cleaning, super hydrophobic. Water droplet go down. It doesn't, you know, bring the dirt with, with with it. Never gets dirty. So imagine you make the surface, you mimic that surface, on a film, and put it on your table. It's like lotus leaves. So in the past, people do coating, uh, to do you know functional coating on your on on surface. These guys no coating, make structure. And how do you make make this structure? How do you make it in large volume? You do roll to roll nano imprint. So what, how you do is you make the mold with the structure. So using um, optical uh, beam lithography, optical lithography, and you, you make the mold and you stamp and print. That's nano imprint, stamp print. And then to do to go mass production, you do roll to roll. So that's that's a. I mean, when I I track nano imprint technology for a long time, but these guys come up with roll to roll and come up and you know, have the product in the market like two years ago already. Amazing. I mean, uh, um, and now they already have products in the in Chinese market, like Chinese identity cards. They make all these, all these structures that they make. It's now replacing a lot of the materials that that um, that's being used and lower cost. So, so our, the key to s of success of these people is that you know better, better and lower cost. That's how they <coughs> take over the market and uh, profitable, obviously. I think their market cap is uh, $300 million in, in that stock market right now. So yeah, that, I think that's all for me. Yeah, we've so got some time for questions. Lorwin, thanks very much. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you. So I think the, the question that's really kind of burning for me is what does this mean for us? I mean, do we have opportunities? You mentioned that supplying equipment's an opportunity now. Is this going to open up new opportunities for the high-tech community outside China? I think one of the, one of the things that the Chinese, um, like the industry park, for example, let's get down to this industry park, for example, they would need very much, because to start everything from scratch takes time. You know, the Chinese like the speed. They want <laughs> to they want yeah. to make things very fast. So they would be interested in licensing uh, or bring in whatever IP is developed, like in the valley. And, and develop the product and enter the market in China. I think that's something that the, the, the industry that would be very interested in is to have, uh, you know, to have, have some sort of joint venture or some sort of a partnership with uh, entrepreneurs here or companies here who are interested in entering the Chinese market. For example, if you, are, if you have any technology that can give high fun better functionality for a smartphone made in China, they will be interested, right? Or, or, or solar cells or, or, or lighting. And anything that they make today, they have already the industry manufacturing capability, and you have something that it's they need. We we went. I mean, I represented one of my portfolio companies. We went to ZTE. We want to sell our transparent conductor films to them. Well, these guys, of course, they don't have very strong R and D, so they said, okay, we we like your material, but can you make the module, <laughs> the touchscreen module, so we can just plug in? Yeah. Or, or we introduce our supplier. Uh, our module supply, you, yeah, you okay. can integrate your films, right? So, so I think if um, the Chinese, they will make the stuff by themselves in any, in any case. Sure. Whether, I mean, they will continue to make those stuff. Actually, so that's kind of the question, is, is this going to lead to greater isolation as opposed to greater globalization? They've got a big market, they've got their own sources of venture capital, they've got mm -hmm. government support. Mm -hmm. Do they really need the outside? Um, this is a very good question. Politically, <laughs> um, I think um, if you if you just isolate China, I think they can do everything by themselves. If, okay. you, if, if they you put them on the moon, 
Do you think they moon, will? Anyway. Yeah, they will go to the moon. <laughs> no, no, no. Do you think they will isolate themselves? They will not. They will not. But, but I'm just saying, hypothetically, if you, put, if you isolate China, they, can do, they literally can do everything by themselves. Well, I mean, there's not many markets that are big enough to develop their own technology standards and not worry about global standards. You know, right, that, that's, right, that's a direct that's true. thing coming off of that. Yeah. I don't want to monopolize too much of the time. I saw your hand. Yes. So thank you for sharing this, uh, this news. And um, those successful cases really impressive. But here I want to um, ask, ask for your opinion on the failing case, mm -hmm. which is SunTech Solar. Suntec Power, yeah, Wuxi yeah. Shangde, you know, that yeah, yeah. company is actually in Wuxi, which is like right next to uh, yes, yeah, no. Suzhou Tech Park. I know those so guys I want, well. Yeah, <laughs> I just want your comment on that case, because uh, like years ago, that's uh, that company was the largest manufacturer for solar panels in the world, mm -hmm. and suddenly announced its bankruptcy. Mm. And, uh, you know, years ago it was uh, regarded as the icon of Chinese high-tech company, now it's mm. A thinking boat. So people are, people are arguing whether it's a special case or is a typical Chinese ch Chinese you know yeah. company that cannot last, cannot cannot really be yeah. sustainable. So what's your opinion? Well, this is a, a very complicated case. Uh, first of all, well, there's a very bad culture in China in terms of a uh, high tech industry. When SunTech Power set up, it was the only solar company. But then when it became successful, everybody set up a solar factory. Literally, you know, one of the company my friend worked in, a so uh, the guy sells soy sauce. I mean, he, he make a fortune selling soy sauce, and he set up a, a solar factory. Of course, he has to shut down the company at some point. But you know, just you know, it's like everybody does the same bloody thing, and and then they flood the market with cheap product because they can't. It's just the, it's oversupply. They just tend to create this oversupply of products. It's, a, it's, a, it's really the bad thing about the culture. I mean, they don't have, they don't respect. Um, I mean, I always use this example of uh, Italian uh, cheese. You know, like if you eat mozzarella, mozzarella is only made. The good mozzarella is only made in Napoli, you know, southern Italy, and no one else makes the same thing. But in China, if you, if you're success, if you, you know, that haircut company is, uh, uh, haircut shop is doing well, everyone else around you will set up a haircut shop. Just that's how it works. Is a you know this is a that ecosystem is going to sustain. Sorry. That ecosystem. That ecosystem. Will that ecosystem sustain that itself? You know, because you have no, this kind of competition no, and so No, it does forth. not. Because when you when you when you do this, when everybody does the same thing and compete with each other, it's just not sustainable. And you have oversupply of everything. I also that raises a question to me. The managers of the science parks, do they start to all think the same way? <laughs> in terms of de selecting particular types of companies or particular business lines of companies. Actually, now the science parks are getting more uh, smarter. For example, like Suzhou will pick areas that uh, they have a differentiation. So they will look at like Wuxi and other places. Will right, they look at, at Wuxi. Areas. Okay, Wuxi yeah. does those um, uh, smart sensors, or they don't do that. Wuxi has this sort of. Um, there's another. They do a big thing in MAMS, but they. They want to differentiate from Wuxi. They build a the foundry only doing certain things, and and Nanjing doing like biotech. You know, so yeah. they so they they try to differentiate themselves. Now the regional government they're getting smarter, but the solar thing and LED same thing oversupply, right? Oversupply. Now the oversupply. There's another problem. This is just one one part of the problem. Now the solar cell, SunTech and many other solar company was having a lot of sales is because they export to Europe primarily. When Europe market slow down. Everybody suffered. Um, so they depend; they are dependent on foreign market export. While internally, they don't consume; they haven't consumed very much solar cell. Now, of course, the government try to invest more and build solar farms, and but that takes time. Right? So it, it, they they had this gap of completely dependent on foreign of uh, consum consumer, and not really internally consume the solar panel. And then, and then the, the government quickly tried to launch a policy, but the adoption, the implementation of the policy of building the farm, this, this gap. So I'm still you know, robust about I'm still optimistic about solar, but it's just you know, too bad that the, the last year, this year, next year is not going to be good. Mm. Sorry. So just Go ahead, finish up. Yeah, so just to clarify, so you think 
Suntech is more of a special case. It's just like yeah. a general. Well, it, you, in Suntech, can read, you, can, you can read a lot of stuff from Suntech. The whole case is too complicated. We can but will there be a lot more right? Suntech oh, yeah. type cases? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Oh, a lot of people Go ahead. Are Go ahead. Oh, it's not a special case. Huh? Yeah. It's a Go ahead. It's a yes, Dr. Liu, could it also be, in addition to culture, also barrier to entry? Yeah. Really? Because, as you know, to make waiver, you know, the solar fake waiver is pretty simple. Everybody could do it, right? Right, right. But <coughs> it's within certain range. Right, right. I mean, efficiency of, what, 2% or so? Right, right, yeah. Right? But the products that you're talking about, the examples you gave us, the four or five companies you highlighted, they have barrier to entry that probably... They have a very good differentiation. Right? Oh, yeah, like the, the Tan Yuan. Well, the, it's the, just the, very difficult, the, the too. The Hua Fai film, yeah, the yeah. Hissing, yeah. that's very unique. So, so that's niche. That's really niche. I mean, that's why I sh uh, the, the stuff that I picked are really innovative. The, the technology have very, you know, you can't just copy. Um, those guys, I mean, I mean, for example, like, okay, to, to look further, I mean, my most favorite company is the, the, the Guafi company because I think they're going to be very sustainable. The other company, I'm not so sure because they enjoy too much government support. Tan Yuan, the uh, e-carbon, actually, his English name is e-carbon. E-carbon very much $20 million revenue, right, first year. And I, I see this company really sustainable because they, they don't get all this benefit from like other companies, like this, I, like all the other companies I mentioned, they all get all the free rent, subsidy, manpower subsidy, everything. So but those are great conditions. Do you think the science parks are going to be essential for high tech companies? You really have to be in a science park if you're going to be serious in China or would there be other ways to get into the market outside the high-tech parks? Uh, <laughs> there's nowhere else to park your company. They, they build these science parks where you can, you, can, you can have your company at home, but they don't do that. A science park is just easy. It's an easy infrastructure for you to access to services. What happens if you start to get turned down by one science park? Are there people who try going from one to the next? Oh, they do. Yeah, they do. Like yeah, some yeah. Shanghai company will move to Suzhou or vice versa. Yeah, you know, yeah. They do that. They, they move around. One more. Go ahead. The science park uh, that you've seen in Suzhou or in China mm -hmm. to the Taiwanese uh, science park, as you know, they play a, play a very big part in Taiwan. Yeah, so like, for example, like <laughs> Xinzhou, Xinzhu. right? Yeah. Um, well, Xinzhou, it's very, I mean, again, it's a very successful and, and um, already especially in the electronic industry. Uh, but the Suzhou one is more, it's beyond electronics. They already have some electronics, uh, but not in the scale of Taiwan. They're building materials. Um, I think, you know, I, I think Taiwan's already doing well, but at the same time, the, the, uh, the way I see this particular case of building this ecosystem and building nanotechnology enable ecosystem I think it's very unique. Mm. Um, it's, 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 the entire thing is so organic, very, very organized, mm. uh, different from other uh, Taiwan or other industry parks. Let me ask one more question, and then we're going to have to break and have Coffee? refreshments. Yeah. The last question. Uh, so five, ten years from now, are we going to see China's version of Intel? Are we going to see a real world leader coming out of this, or is it going to be a good system that's very good inside China? But are we going to see the next Intel coming out of this? Why not? Um, I don't see China's going to build like Huawei, the kind of company will... I don't see Huawei as very innovative. I mean, in terms of... Uh, I mean, they're already big. Yeah, they're big, but they're, they're... Big doesn't mean that they're very innovative. R they're well... The, um, but I, I, I see Intel but as from a very these innovative little companies, company. Are they go, you know. um, I don't see... I, I think China will, be ha will have a lot of uh, SMEs strong SME uh, in terms of the emerging technology. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it's not going to be Intel, IBM. It's different. Okay. But the, the companies like Huawei, ZTE, these are companies that are growing pretty big, but they are not focusing on a lot. They're not spending a lot in R&D the, the way what I've seen in Japan and the U.S. and, and in Korea. I think they just have no patience to do that. And then I think the dominant phenomena will be the SMEs, what I mentioned, these companies that, that I mentioned, these companies are going to grow and thrive. So okay. Sir, sir. I think... IP, right? IP culture. How those SMEs could be sustainable over the longer period? Particularly the high-tech, oh, nanotechnology enabled companies. 
I forgot to mention IP. Uh, there's a there's an increasing respect for IP because th those entrepreneurs, they 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 depend on they it. depend on IP. They need to they protect their own IP. They also respect IP. So the culture will change in China, but like I said, I mean no guarantee of protection because China is very big, and you protect your IP in this part, you go to another part, you, it's very difficult to suit those guys. Let's actually, Walter, let's take it offline. We're running over time, and I'm not supposed to do that for Stanford. So thanks very much, Dr. Liu, and we'll talk more over coffee.